If you love apples and other fruits as much as I do, you're gonna love this show. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. You may be wondering what I'm up to. Well, I'm over my head in apples, apple trees that is. You see, this is a young crop of Honeycrisp apple trees, one of my favorites. We'll learn about a couple of varieties of raspberries I have growing at the farm and make this fantastic rustic blackberry gobbler. You'll love it. I also wanna show you how I use gourds and apples in my kitchen. Plus introduce you to my new orchard at the farm. There's so much to cover, but first we need to take a quick break and when we return, We'll talk about apples, so stay tuned. So Bill, you know, years ago, if you went to somebody's house or small farm, everybody had fruit trees. It seems like now there's a renewed interest in having a few fruit trees. I think because of the economy, I think it's one reason. You know, I think that it's surprising to people how fast these trees grow, like an apple or a peach or a pear. Yeah, we're looking at apples now start grafting in the February. They take the top of uh, one of these branches here and they cut it so long, usually about four inches. We get the understalk in, which is an apple root. So they marry together yeah, the, they the marry root together. part and the top yeah. part. And then we uh, use tape, tape them up and put them in a box about 16, 18 days and they're ready. And then from there they, they root they go in. To the field. Yeah, I'll go to the field either in like we did here in one gallons, or you can take them to the field and they grow. Now let me ask you this, let's go back to the root. The root stock can be any kind of apple. Apple, stock. yeah. Yeah, and then the top could be any of the varieties. Any different. variety, maybe a Red Delicious or a granny Yellow Smith. Delicious or Granny or a, a Honeycrisp, any of them. Well, I'm impressed with these Honeycrisp apples that you've grown and it's hard for me to believe that these plants have gone from a plant this size to this size here. Mm -hmm. In, in a year. Yeah, but so yeah, the root is already a two year root then, right. and a one year top. So, so by having that established, established root system, system it just shoots, shoots right shoots up. On up yeah. For someone who's, who's got an average backyard, they've got full sun, how many apple trees would they need to plant to make sure they got good probably pollination? For, for pollination, you probably two, like a red or a yellow or a honey crisp and a Maybe a cooking apple, one of those, Jonathan or Macintosh or one of those varieties. Honeycrisp is a pretty good pollinating a, apple, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. What kills a apple tree is a, a late frost. Some people can cover them up and protect them when they're small. These semi dwarfs don't supposed to get more than 12 to 15 foot or something like that. The semi dwarf really is the, the better way to go, isn't it? You don't yeah. want a full size apple. You don't apple want tree. a full size apple no more. They don't hardly grow any full size apples anymore. They're all dwarf or or semi-dwarf. They're just so much easier to take care of. They bear quicker too, being dwarf. Same in peaches, plums, pears, because if you want big fruit, that's what you gotta do. See that, it's feeding all of them if you leave them on there, so that means. Right, you just get, you get fewer fruit, but all of, they're larger. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for taking the time to show me around today. Okay. Yeah. After this short break, I'll show you how I used apples and gourds in my kitchen, and then we'll talk raspberries. So stay right where you are. Whenever I get a chance to use something inside my home that I've harvested from the garden, I think big. Last fall was no exception. Let's look back at a creative way I've used apples and gourds to decorate the kitchen. I think a kitchen is a wonderful place to bring in the bounty of the garden. Well, not only to eat, but to use as decoration. And that's what I've done here. In this kitchen, I have a very large island, so I have plenty of room to do interesting displays. In fact, this island is approximately six by 10 feet. So here in the center, what I've done is I've created an ensemble of things gathered from the farm, picked up at the florist, at the grocery store, and so forth. So why don't we take a closer look at how I came up with this concept and its design. And we'll start with the vessels first. As you can see, I've used some large ceramic 
containers. These big jars, if you will, are filled with some things from the farm. I have growing out there this time of year lots of kefir pears. They grow in our espalier trees. They have a beautiful blush on this chartreuse green. And the other thing that I'm using lots of are gourds. I'm using them not only in these big jars, but also in the assembly around them. Now another vessel I've used is the apothecary jar that I've filled with pinto beans. Pinto beans, why? Well, the color works very well with this color scheme. I love the rich brown. You could fill that with coffee beans or even black-eyed peas. Now, another vessel that I'm using are stumps that have been sawed off so you can use them as really containers for houseplants. These wooden stumps are lined with plastic and I've used an arrowhead plant, a house plant, growing out of the top of each one of them to add a touch of foliage. Now some other objects that I've used here in this assembly include some cast iron acorns as well as some little pumpkins made out of vines and also some things that I picked up at the grocery store in the way of winter squash. You can see that I've assembled this where I have the larger objects in the center and then sort of spilling down to the lower objects at the edge. The whole idea here here is just to go hunt and gather what you can find. Use things that are in season and stick with a particular color theme. What I've used here is brown and shades of green. Since this show is all about fruit, I'd like to tell you about one of my favorites, raspberries. Last summer I had a bumper crop. Let's have a look. There's so much going on out here at the farm this time of year. We've got squash and tomatoes and all kinds of vegetables. And we also have some of the late season fruits coming on, late blackberries and this particular variety of raspberry. Now this one's called Heritage. And what's special about Heritage is it's considered an ever bearing raspberry. Now we have another variety here on the farm called Dorman Red and it's already finished up. We have a long row of them and that particular variety has to be trestled because the vines are very thin and don't support themselves. But when they're loaded with fruit, it's such a gorgeous picture. Now this variety, Heritage, you can see has very strong canes, so it doesn't have to be trestled. Although we do have some wires here that we can run the canes through like this. You might say, which is your favorite? I have to say Heritage is, just from a flavor standpoint. The Dorman Red is a little tart for me, but it's still very good. Now when we planted these, they were just bare root sticks. We planted them about two to two and a half feet apart, bare root canes, and just within a year, they produced berries. And what was so interesting is on the Heritage, by fall, they were already producing fruit that first year. Whereas with the Dorman Reds, it took them a full year. It was the next year until we started seeing raspberries. Now just look at the fruit set we're already seeing on Heritage here. It won't be long and these clusters will turn into bright red raspberries. And they're so delicious in so many different types of recipes. So follow these tips and you'll be on your way to a better garden. Okay, I just want to take a minute and give you the background on this space. You know, I tend to get carried away with things. In fact, this orchard ended up being two acres. Yikes. Now, you don't have to lose your mind like I did and plant this many trees. Just a few in your backyard will be all you'll need to enjoy in your kitchen. But what we did here, just this last spring, so it's a very young orchard, we started with clearing the land. You see, this was just a bunch of scrub oak and underbrush with a few nice pines, of which we saved and sent to the sawmill. This part of the farm had been timbered back in the 1950s, so there really weren't a lot of nice big trees. Next, we had to prepare the soil, and to prepare it, we had to remove lots of rocks. I mean, tons of them. And then we brought in load after load of compost mixed with our clay-based soil. Now the next thing I wanted to do was make sure that we had plenty of open space for our equipment such as trucks and tractors to drive through. So I set out these paths which are about 12 feet wide and we covered them with our local river gravel. So it really helped make an interesting design. What ended up happening is we ended up with 12 of these big rectangles in this space. You can really appreciate it from the air. 
it looks like a colossal space. You can kind of see the way in which these areas are identified by color. The center of these parterres or these rectilinear shapes is filled with wheat straw that mulched the trees. And then outlining each one, we used pine straw our pine needles. It's a little bit darker. We put those around all the blueberries we planted here. And then of course you see the pathways done in the river gravel I mentioned. Then we set posts where each tree would be planted. In each one of these blocks we planted, oh, about seven to nine trees on a very specific grid because, you know, the design of it is very important to me. Then what I did is I bordered it all in the blueberries. Um, and then the center part, just for fun, late in the season, we sowed Cosmos seed. And for about four or five weeks, this was just covered in beautiful orange blossoms. It was a great way to add color to the fall. All right, now, over the years to come, we're gonna have more fruit out here than we know what to do with. I can't wait. Over the years, visitors to my farm have become acquainted with Miss Big Fig. She's a big brown turkey fig that's well over 100 years old. She produces an amazing number of sweet, very delicious figs. Now, originally, Miss Big Fig was planted up on the hill near the house where the flagpole is today. But when I began to design the garden, I needed a focal point, a terminus at the far east end of the garden, so I decided to plant her there. Now, if you love the flavor of figs like I do, and you'd like to grow some yourself, here's some things you might keep in mind. You see, figs are reliably cold hardy in zone seven and southward not so much northward. They can survive winter temperatures down to 15 to 20 degrees. Now you can grow them north of zone seven if you provide them with winter protection or grow them in containers that can be stored in a garage or basement. You see varieties such as Celeste and Brown Turkey are particularly cold hardy varieties. Now you need to understand that the roots of a fig tree are more resilient than the branches. So if an unusual harsh winter zaps the tree back to the ground, don't panic, it will most likely come back from the roots. Warmth and plenty of sunlight are important for good fruit development. Plant your fig in an area that will receive at least six to eight hours of sunlight a day. In northern regions, it's a good idea to select a warm microclimate, such as against a south-facing brick wall, where the tree will receive ample light and heat. In areas where summers are exceptionally hot, give your fig a little protection from that hot afternoon sun. If you take on growing some figs, you'll soon discover that moisture is an important component to producing beautiful fruit. You see, if you have too much moisture, say the soil is soggy, this will result in the fruit actually splitting. On the other hand, if you're trying to grow figs in soil that's really dry, you're gonna produce rock hard fruit that never fully ripens. These are just a few things for you to keep in mind if you decide to grow some figs. Now after the break, we'll make this rustic blackberry cobbler, so stay tuned. One of my favorite desserts is a blackberry cobbler. Oh, I just love them. Last summer, we had more blackberries than we knew what to do with. So I made this easy rustic blackberry cobbler. I wanna show you how to do it. One of my favorite desserts in the summer around here is a blackberry cobbler, a simple, delicious dessert. Well, not just the summer, I have to say, we freeze our blackberries and we use them in cobblers and pies throughout the entire year. Now, here at the farm, we grow lots of different varieties of blackberries, even a thornless one, which you might consider for your own garden. The fruits are really quite large. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm taking a pie crust. You can make your own or you can buy one that's pre-made. I'm using a pre-made pie crust here and I'm basically cutting it into four pieces. And I want to show you what I'm going to do with these four pieces of pie crust. I'm taking a five ounce ramekin. I've used a spray oil in there and I'm taking the pie crust and I'm just very loosely lining it. Well, when I say loosely lining it, I mean I'm letting the crust hang over the edge like that. So we're going to fold that over. What I like is a really good crust to berry to juice ratio. So, uh, so often cobblers don't have enough crust to suit me, but this recipe certainly does. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get all of these ready. Now with the ramekin lined, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of these blackberries, and these are some that we grew last year and we froze. I'm just gonna fill that almost full. Remember, they're gonna create a lot of juice, so um, it's just about to the edge there. And, then what I do is I take a couple tablespoons of sugar, or about a tablespoon and a half, really, 
just kind of put in the top. And then just a pinch of salt and a pinch of orange zest. Orange is your secret ingredient here. And then just a teaspoon of either orange juice or I like to use triple sec. All right, let all that seep in there together and then just gently fold the crusts up and over like this. Kind of pinch it, hold together. I like a really sort of wild and wacky top on them. And then you just take a little bit of butter and brush on the top of the crust. And then I like to take a little bit of that sugar and sprinkle on it and it's ready to go into the oven. Now, in a preheated oven, 350 degrees, what you wanna do is you wanna leave them in there for 35 to 45 minutes, and that's what they look like. You can grow berries in so many different places. You can grow them in a garden, raised beds, even in containers on your back patio. But the best of all, they're great in recipes like this. I don't know about you, but I love plants that are both beautiful and delicious. And this is a great example of that plant. We're in a beautiful display garden here at the Berry Family of Nurseries. And what they've done is they've taken this little dwarf blueberry called Top Hat. It's very dense and compact. It makes a beautiful border. But if you look closely, these plants are loaded with blueberries. Even though they're deciduous, they're gonna lose their leaves in the winter. What's great about it in the fall, all these leaves turn beautiful colors of red and orange. So they are excellent in the autumn landscape. And here in the heat of summer, you can see that they're keeping this hedge clipped almost like a boxwood hedge. And it's beautiful juxtaposed this dwarf budley or butterfly bush. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh No, I can't help but smile.